A woman faces the unimaginable. There had to be a purpose in allowing this to happen. Her parents murdered in cold blood. God makes no mistakes. And a twist only he saw coming. God had a plan. Hear Bonnie Floyd's true story of murder and redemption on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. Her story is one of intrigue, murder, and betrayal. But it doesn't end there. Bonnie Floyd joins us today. She'll tell us how her real-life nightmare ended with forgiveness and redemption. When her parents were brutally murdered, Bonnie was heartbroken. The only hope she had left was the promise her father made. But how would she ever know if he kept it? Bonnie Floyd's nightmare started in 1994 at 6 o'clock in the morning. She answered the phone and learned her parents, who were sailing in the West Indies, were murdered, along with two others in cold blood aboard the yacht Challenger. God had a plan. The day that I got the phone call that my parents had been killed, my pastor said to me these words, God could have prevented this, but he did not. And the one thing I know for certain is that God makes no mistakes. There had to be a purpose in allowing this to happen. Two years later, the quadruple murder trial began. Closure and justice were about to be served, or so she thought. Bound to a Promise tells the true story of love, murder, and redemption, and how Bonnie found peace in the midst of tragedy. We want to welcome Bonnie to the show. Bonnie, it's so good to have you here. Your story is so remarkable. Let's go back to the day in February when your life really changed. Okay. So it was six o'clock in the morning and the phone rang and I answered it. And the man on the other line, his voice was unfamiliar to me. And he asked me a question and he said, are you Bonnie Clever Floyd? And when I got married, I didn't hyphenate my name. So any reference to my maiden name, Clever, always had something to do with my father. And for the first time in 33 years, the last person I wanted to be was Bill Clever's daughter, and I had no idea why. Yeah. Here, your, your dad, and really she became like another mother to you, oh, yes. your stepmom, yes, had gone on this amazing adventure sailing around mm -hmm. the world and journaling all of it, and you were sort of living vicariously through them. Yes. So this was so unexpected. What the phone call was to tell you that they had been brutally murdered. Mm -hmm. What went through your mind? Well, at first, I was told for investigative purposes that they had been shot in their sleep. And so I had been witnessing to them because I wasn't raised in a Christian home and I had been you know, sharing Jesus with them. And um, I had a conversation with my dad just six months, with both of them six months before he died. Mm -hmm. uh, he was sharing a near-death experience of a sailing couple friends of theirs. And uh, at the end of the story, I just said, Dad, just promise me if you ever get into a position that you fear for your life, that you'll call on the name of Jesus. And he looked at me and my nickname's Bean, and he says, Bean, I promise you, if I ever get into a position that I fear for my life, I'll call on the name of Jesus. But I have never been, nor will I ever be, in a position that I am not in total control. Wow. And six wow. months later, God showed him that no man is always in total control. So here you are. Your dad has made this promise to you that he will call upon the name of Jesus. Now you're told that they've been brutally murdered in their sleep. You must have been devastated wondering what was, what's their eternity. Yes. What did your pastor say to you at that time? He called me and Pastor G.L. Johnson from People's Church in Fresno, California, and just a, a, a man of God, raised me up once I became a Christian. And he said to me, Bonnie, God could have prevented this, yeah. but he did not. And the one thing I know for certain is that God makes no mistakes. Yeah, which I'm sure was a life jacket to hang on to at the time, but yes. you didn't actually find out that in fact, 
they weren't killed in their sleep till a long time right, later. What right. happened? It was weeks later, and I got a call saying for investigative purposes, uh, they Scotland Yard, who took over the case and uh, captured the three men who did this, that um, they didn't want, they wanted everyone to think that, to mm -hmm. aid them in their sure. investigation, but they had actually been bound and gagged for at least four hours before they were, were killed. Now, Bonnie, a lot of people would have been traumatized at the thought that their parents had gone through that, but for you it meant the promise oh, yes. was kept. Yes, it was that seemingly act of torture yeah. bought them time. Yeah. Time to consider Jesus, time to make keep their promise to me. Time to realize your right. life's out of control right now. Right. You need, <laughs> you have a need. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You attended the trial of these three men. What was that like? I mean, for most of us, we've never gone through anything like this. And then even when you contemplate it, you just can't imagine the things you would feel seeing the people who harmed your loved ones. Yes, I went there strictly the sole purpose was to be a presence mm -hmm. in the courtroom to represent my parents. And that is the only reason I went. And my mother-in-law, she uh, refers to me as the stone that rarely weeps. I'm not a big crier. Yeah. But in the courtroom, when one was testifying, I just had this compassion and I didn't want to feel it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to shake it off and I couldn't. And so I went outside and on the balcony of this dilapidated courthouse, I, I asked the Lord, what is happening? And he said, you're experiencing this much, just this much of my compassion wow. for Donaldson. And I said, what do you want me to do with this? And he said, I want you to go to the prison and I want you to tell him about my son, Jesus. Whew. And so when the trial was over, God made a miraculous way for me to get into the prison because they don't have rights, they don't have visitors to get in, literally, yes, yeah. literally took the hand of God to move and he moved and I got in. What was that like? It was uh, because I went through so much to get in that when it happened, it was a miracle. So I, I, I had the confidence mm -hmm. that God was sending me there. But even in that, I was just going to be obedient. I was gonna tell him about Jesus and I was out of there. Yeah. I didn't go there to say, I forgive you for what you did yeah. to my parents. So what happened? So I got there and he no longer was just this man that they captured, but he began to talk to me and he began to tell me how sorry he was. Yeah. He told me I wasn't the one that pulled the trigger, and but I looked at him and I said, but sin is sin. Yeah. And you went there to steal and you bound and you gagged them. Yeah. And your price to pay for sin is 15 years. And the other two were sentenced to death by hanging. Oh my. Now they're still alive because there's been a stay put on capital punishment. But even in that, God, the fact that they're still alive, God has been moving and orchestrating things just recently that would have never happened yeah. if they would have, if they would have hung. Such a story of uh, miraculous provision and restoration. Mm -hmm. And recently, yes. you actually went to this island where these men were from and, and where this all occurred. Talk about that. Well, God, uh, I found out in September that one of the two, the mastermind, had been let out on a work program. And while he was on this work program, he did some horrible things on the beach and he was not raking the seaweed. Yeah. And when I found out about it, I became an advocate. I wrote the prime minister and the government and radio and television and he was pulled from the program and I received an apology from the government of Antigua. Wow. And I, I think it's so important that I share this, that afterwards I was asking the Lord, why, why, did, you, why did you allow this to happen? And he said, Bonnie, do you trust me? And I said, you know I do, Lord. And he said, I'm keeping your story fresh. Wow. And all of that that transpired is what opened the doors in January. And I went there and I met with Donaldson and we did, we filmed together so I could have a video of him at my conferences. Mm -hmm. So I'm not just telling about them, but they can meet him through video. Yeah. And, and, and um, the people came out to and you. And the people came out. They had an island-wide open air event 
where all the island of Barbuda came out and I shared my story of forgiveness and showed them that I truly forgave their, their son, mm -hmm. Donaldson. And then the highest ranking government official and the highest ranking religious authority came forward and asked me to forgive their, them and their island for what happened. Because 22 years ago, when the, when the shedding of innocent blood occurred, they believed that God cursed their island because everything that was in existence 22 years ago now lies in ruins. And anything wow. that has been tried to, to begin has now been abandoned, built, wow. and it's been abandoned. So interesting. You know, you get the sense that this is still not the end of the story, that you're going to watch God's hand yes. of favor upon an island that was obedient to ask forgiveness yes. for innocent blood being spilled. Wow. I mean, this is so, this is biblically deep. <laughs> it is. <laughs> wow. And we are just touching the surface of Bonnie's story. You need to read this book. Pick up a copy of her book, Bound to a Promise. This is available on her website. It's bonniefloyd.com and on Amazon. And you need to get a hold of it. It's quite a story of God's faithfulness, His restoration restoration, his provision, and the power of forgiveness. Thank you. Thank Great you for to having you with me. us. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. Gordon? Well, still ahead, a young boy gets a visit from his favorite superhero. And best of all, you help make it happen. Watch the magic moment when we come back. CBN's Superbook is bringing the stories of the Bible to children all over the world. It's also made a superhero out of a little boy from the Philippines named Ezekiel. Ezekiel's parents treasure every moment they have with their two-year-old son. Michael and Lori serve in the Philippine Navy and are sometimes away for weeks at a time. He's an affectionate and sweet boy. He clings to his dad when we say our goodbyes. Ezekiel stays with his grandparents while his parents work. But Sundays are special because that's the day when they're all home together and watch their favorite TV program, CBN Superbook. Lori used to watch the classic version as a child. I remember how the kids would travel to another place in time. Ezekiel also likes it when Superbook travels back in time. Ezekiel has asked lots of questions about the Bible stories. Recently, they watched a giant adventure, and he learned how David was able to defeat Goliath by the power of God. David shot with a stone and hit him here. Boom! Goliath fell down. <laughs> Who gives you the power? From Papa Jesus. Superbook helps me show him what's right and what's not good. It helps me explain who God is and what Jesus did on the cross for us. Now, he initiates prayer before meals and he says I'm sorry when he has heard the playmate. Ezekiel looks up to David, so Lori made him a costume complete with a slingshot and sandals. When she heard about a Superbook Bible costume contest, she sent in Ezekiel's photo and he won first place. Gizmo paid them a surprise visit to deliver their prize. Ezekiel won a set of Superbook DVDs from Season 1. Now, he watches Superbook whenever he wants. We can also show them to kids in our neighborhood and hold a Bible study with them. I'm so grateful to CBN for the new Superbook. It gives children a chance to learn lessons from the Bible. What a wonderful story. Just imagine having something that Children say, I want to watch a Bible story. I want to be involved in that. I want to get excited about what David did. Uh, I want to have the anointing that was on David. All these things are happening because children are watching the stories of the Bible. They're getting involved. They're getting engaged. And best of all, they're learning the Bible. And they're doing it in a way they love. We're taking the stories of the Bible to the children of the world. Right now, we're in 38 different languages. We're on our way to... 50 languages, and there's the uh, broadcast map will be in, in 50 by the end of the year. And then we've been challenged to take it to 500 languages, uh, which would be absolutely marvelous. And we need help to do that. Uh, we need you 
to join with us, to say, yes, I want to be a part of it. I want to be a part of taking the stories of the Bible to the children of the world. So how can you do that? Well, you can join the Superbook DVD Club. And for a gift of $25 or more, we'll send you the latest episode, not just one copy. We'll send you three copies of Nehemiah. That's the one that just came out this week, Nehemiah. So you'll get not one copy, but three copies, so you can share it with your family, with your church, and you can be a part of distributing the stories of the Bible. Then, every time a new episode comes out, you'll be first to get it. And again, not one copy, you'll get three copies and we'll bill your credit card $25. Uh, do it. And if you want to make a special gift to Superbook, you can do that too. All you have to do is call us, 888-777-1999. You can say, yes, I want to be a part of it. Or you can log on to cbn.com. There's a place there on the giving page where you can sign up for Superbook. Do it now, 888-777-1999. Terry? Well, still ahead, a basketball star recalls the biggest game of her life. I broke a record that no male nor female has broken yet, but the crazy part about the game was that it wasn't me. It must have been angels or someone, something around me. It's just like, oh my gosh, this is an answered prayer. The WNBA's Candace Wiggins talks about her true legacy after this. Well, last March, one of the WNBA star players announced her retirement after eight years in the league. Candace Wiggins has had a storied basketball career, leaving a legacy much like her father's, Major League Baseball player Alan Wiggins. Candace grew up in his shadow and shouldered a burden that began when she was four years old. Candace Wiggins always had the raw talent and drive to be one of the best. A point guard and Southern California native, Candace achieved her dream of playing in the WNBA after a record-breaking career at Stanford University. Growing up, she was often compared to her father, Major League Baseball player Alan Wiggins. She was four when he died from AIDS after a long struggle with depression and drug abuse. I ran like him, I looked like him. So that became like kind of my blueprint of how I was going to succeed because my family, I gave them so much comfort. In the wake of his death, Candace felt that her family's well-being depended on her ability to carry on his legacy of success. It was definitely the driving force for me and I knew that there was a way that I could create joy in a situation where there was so much pain. In high school, Candace carried her team to two state titles, earning her a full ride to Stanford. There she became a four-time All-American. Even then, she felt her team's success depended on how well she performed. One thing that I did carry very heavy at Stanford was this idea of putting the women's basketball program on my back to the point where even my senior year at Stanford, my coach, Tara Vanderveer, <laughs> said, you're carrying us, I'm putting pressure on you because we're going with you. Candace had become so focused on doing well at basketball that her childhood commitment to Jesus Christ lost its place in her life. I had never communicated with him. I had a Bible in my dorm that my grandmother gave me that I just did not even, it was a cumbersome length, I was intimidated by it. I just didn't, I didn't dive in, I didn't, I didn't pray. Even though she was making a name for herself, Candace was still under the shadow of her father's dark legacy. But now as I was getting bigger and bigger in college, this monster that was following me was creeping up. That monster confronted her in March 2008. Hours before her team was to go up against Maryland in the NCAA quarterfinals, she went online to read an article that had been written about her. I was thinking that I was going to read this wonderful write-up on myself and just how great and, man, they got to talk about how it was just the biggest game of my life. And here I'm looking for it and there's nothing on me. It's all on my dad. It dawned on Candace that people cared more about how well she performed than they did her. It hit me like a knockout punch. It, I felt defeated. I felt like no one cares for my soul. That's how I felt. 
For the first time, I felt like I had been born into terrible circumstances and I just kind of started questioning. This is the biggest game in my entire life. Our family legacy is on the line. My legacy is on the line. My WNBA, you know, dreams are on the line. Everything is on the line. And I couldn't, couldn't go to my coach. I couldn't go to my friends. I knew they didn't have the answers. I knew there was only one source and I just said, I'm gonna go straight to the source. Candace knew the only one she could turn to was God. I was pleading with God, please just, if nothing else, just erase all of this pain and just, you know, it's, it's me and you now, you know? And it was like the first time that I actually relied on, on that, on my prayer. Then it was like this quietness. It was like this calm and this peace. Okay, this is something's different now. Candace scored a career high 41 points that night leading her team to victory and a spot in the final four. I broke a record that no male nor female has broken yet, but the crazy part about the game was that it wasn't me. Like I wasn't, there must have been angels or someone, something around me because every shot I would take, I would take it and be like, why would you shoot that? That's terrible. I would just throw it up and it would go in and then it shoot again and it just went in, it in. It's just like, oh my gosh, this is an answered prayer. The team lost their final four matchup against the University of Tennessee, ending Candace's college career. But now Candace didn't base her identity on wins or losses, or even her father. It came from her relationship with Jesus Christ. It was God answering my prayer in that time. He, he knows us when we're at our lowest point and him understanding exactly what I needed. I needed him to hear me and for him to talk to me through the game to finally be Candace Wiggins and not Alan Wiggins' daughter. Recently, after eight years in professional basketball, Candace announced her retirement. She's grown in her faith and has learned even more about her identity in Jesus Christ. But there's one lesson she'll always take with her. For me, Jesus was a path to follow a leader. He gave me an outlet, a way where I didn't have to be perfect. My life didn't have to be perfect. He gave me a way out of all of the, the guilt that I had held on to, all of the people pleasing. I finally could just exhale. And you can do the same thing. You can have that same kind of relationship. You heard her heart in that when, when Candace said, I needed him to hear me. We all need that. We all need to have the assurance that he hears us. And the wonderful news is he does. And the wonderful news is he knows you by name. He knows Candace by name. He knows you by name. He calls you by name because he is your father. And when you get that revelation that God isn't mad at you, he's not off somewhere in some distant galaxy on a throne, but he's right there. In him, we live and move and have our being. And for Candace, that answer, that knowledge that he heard, that he was there, that he knew her by name, all of that came, and of all places, a basketball game. For you, it can happen right where you are, where you can call to him and he will answer you. That's his promise. If you want to read the promise, go to Jeremiah 33, 3, and you'll see it there in writing. Call to me and I will answer you. And he will call you by name. All you have to do is open up to say, God, if you're there, if you love me, if you are my father, could you show me? Could you show up for me? If you want to do that right now, don't change the channel, but let today be the day where you know that there's a creator. You know that there's a father for you right now. If you want this, Bow your head. Don't turn away. Bow your head. Let's pray. And let's let God answer your prayer. Pray with me. 
Jesus. That's right, just say his name, say it out loud, Jesus. I open the door of my heart and I ask that you come in. And Jesus, open my ear that I can hear your voice. Open my eye that I may know you, for I ask it in Jesus' name. If you prayed with me, there's somebody standing by a phone that would love to pray with you and love to be with you. All you have to do is call it, 888-777-1999. Here's a promise, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 